everyone. So happy to have you join me. We've got a great session scheduled for this afternoon. All right, so here we go. Let's dive in to nutrition for firefighters. Um, again, using the chat feature because I really like to keep this interactive. Um, I want to ask you to share, if you feel comfortable, what would you classify as your number one struggle with nutrition? Um, when you signed up for this webinar, I asked you to give me some feedback, let me know where you're joining from, what local you're with, what department you're with, um, and then maybe your number one struggle. And I heard a, a wide variety of things that people are struggling with, um, but I would love to hear directly from you. And my goal really is to make sure that I'm addressing what those challenges are, because odds are you are not alone in that challenge, but also to make sure that I'm able to make connections with the simple solutions that I will be delivering today that will actually get you on the path to eating in a way that's, that fits your body, that supports your goals and your lifestyle. So there are some really common struggles that I hear amongst firefighters. One of them is stress eating or mindless eating, you know, being tired, uh, coming off shift and wanting to just mass consume a lot of food. Sometimes the struggle is, you know, I'm not able to stay consistent between competing priorities at home or with the crew that I'm on duty with, you know, everybody has different needs and preferences, et cetera. I see here fire hall food, yep, consistency, snacking and portion control, yes. Another one, I don't know if this speaks to you, uh, sweets. <laughs> For some reason, our communities think that the best way they can show appreciation to firefighters and first responders is to shower you with sugar, with brownies and cookies and donuts and all of the things. Um, I don't know why, maybe that's uh, unspoken love language, but that seems to be a common thing. What I am going to do though, is actually challenge your thinking today because we do have some conditioning, I'll use that word, some conditioning that makes us assume that there are only certain ways to be healthy. And I want you to check that a little bit. I'm a big fan of 90s hip hop, particularly Ice Cube. And he reminds us to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves because there are some bad things that are bad for our health. And one of these is this very black and white perspective of viewing food. This food is labeled good, this food is labeled bad. And what you'll discover about me and how we talk about this is that I can make a case for literally anything. There is a time and a place for anything. For example, there's a time and a place to eat a donut or um, you know, something that may, might be considered indulgent. And then there's also a time and a place to eat some grilled chicken, some roasted broccoli, maybe some brown rice. And really for me, the power is understanding kind of some fundamentals about our own bodies and about food that help you identify those things so that you can be more informed. You're actually in the driver's seat of deciding what you should eat and when. Because for many of us, when we think about food, it's only until our stomachs start talking to us or we get bored that it comes from the back of our mind to the front of our mind. And now we're thinking about it. We can't stop thinking about it. And what I will challenge you to do is to just be a little bit more intentional about how you think about this. Sean, I love what you put here, eating like an animal at work, but we'll gen generally only eat one meal dinner at home. Sean, we're gonna talk about that this integration between on duty versus off. So before we get started, I wanna share a little bit about me. My name is Lisa Desolet. Um, I am the IAFF nutrition consultant. So I've partnered with the International to put together a very comprehensive nutrition campaign specifically for you as a firefighter, but also recognizing that this doesn't happen solely inside the firehouse because you're only on duty for roughly a third of your life. So what do we do the other two thirds? How do we integrate this? I also run an online nutrition business where I coach others uh, to do really an integrative approach to nutrition. I also, what kind of gives me a leg up, not kind of, it very much gives me a leg up, is I've been a part of the FIRE family for over 20 years. I'm married to a captain here in Idaho. That's where I'm located. My husband, Phil Deslett, is here on the left. And I have had a front row seat to life in the fire service. So 
when we talk about this, you don't have to explain to me what shift schedule is like. You don't have to explain to me what types of calls you go on. I know them, I hear about them all the time. I've also observed firsthand the demand that is put on your body depending on the call that you have to respond to. What I also understand is the culture inside the firehouse. You know, tater tot casserole is a thing. I know that you love all of the meat. Um, so having that insider perspective really helps me take what I, my, it's, it's really tailored my approach to take real science that we know about nutrition, what to be healthy, what research tells us, and then apply it to real life because that's where we do this. That's where we live. I also am the mom of three kids. So feeding a family, especially a, you know, a bigger family is very real to me and they're all growing athletes. So also thinking about how you can do this outside of the firehouse in the context of your real life comprehensively. Um, that's what I'm about. So that's why I'm here. Now, um, I wanna talk with you a little bit. I like to start out level setting on why you are even here. Yes, I'm sure you have goals and you are trying to prioritize nutrition. There's something deeper there. It's not just about the food on your plate. So I'm gonna share the story of a case study with you. This is someone I know, um, and I won't disclose who they are. Uh, there, you know, there's parts and pieces of their story that maybe have been put together, you know, a compilation of uh, things. But as I tell this story, I want you to consider what part of this sounds or feels familiar to me? Because likely there might be elements of this that are familiar to you personally or someone that you know. And the why behind what we do is really what makes this sticky. If we don't have a why, a deep why behind what we do, well, inevitably when things get hard because change is hard, we're gonna throw it out and we're gonna say, no, it's not worth it anymore. So let me tell you the story about a firefighter that I know that prior to being a firefighter, they grew up playing team sports. They were also a wrestler, you know, played football. And when they graduated high school, they got out into the workforce, did construction, landscape, really loved doing work like physical labor with their body. They also loved the team environment of working on a crew. And when they found the fire service, it was like the perfect storm for them. Oh my gosh, this is the career that I was meant to have. They very much wanted to serve their community. They liked the dynamic environment of the firehouse uh, and the team camaraderie that came along with it. So they dedicated the better part of 20 years to building a career in the fire service. And because of the work that you do, you know, you use your bodies a lot. Uh, their body got pretty taxed and they ended up sustaining some injuries over time. And unfortunately, kind of the injury that got to them the most, they were on top of a roof, cutting, uh, ventilating, they were cutting a roof uh, and they heard a pop, something happened and uh, they needed, they, you know, needed some attention on their knee. So they go to the doctor and unfortunately, over the period of that 20-ish years, they had also put on an extra 80 to 90 pounds. So this is a person that was carrying a lot of excess weight that was not helpful for them, it was not good weight. So the injury combined with the years of kind of unhealthy habits, limited mobility and unhealthy weight gain, they ended up needing total knee replacement surgery. And as you can imagine, um, rehab didn't go as well as planned. Uh, they didn't get full mobility of their knee. Um, and the doctor said, hey, you've been talking about some other stuff on your other knee. Let's take a look at that just to see what's going on there. Well, come to find out, they needed their other knee <laughs> to be replaced. So they had double knee replacement surgery inside a year and long story short, this person, because of the excess weight gain, some of the challenges that they experienced throughout their career, some of the health risks that they uh, had built up, they were now, you know, limited mobility, trying to recover from surgery, managing multiple health risks. They were hypertensive, uh, pre-diabetic, struggling with sleep apnea, taking a, a variety of medications. Well, they had an increased health risk and they couldn't get cleared to go back to the line. Their knees were not recovering the way that they needed to in order to be cleared medically to return to duty. 
So this person after 20 years was asked to medically retire and they decided, yeah, this is probably what's best for me, even though I'm not ready for it. So now we have this whole host of things physically that are going on with them. And now we've added on this layer of some behavioral health, some emotional, psychological stuff. So you can see how there was kind of this downward spiral for them. And they had what appeared to be kind of a, a decline in their quality of life. They struggled with some relationships, couldn't really get on top of managing uh, their health risks and some of the diagnoses that they received until they had a very real kind of reckoning and they got some intervention. But I share this because again, there are aspects of the story that are likely familiar. Either you know someone or you've experienced some of these as well. And the reason this is important is not because I would ever say, oh, if this person just ate better, their life would look different. All I'm saying is that unfortunately, sometimes the cards get stacked against you as a firefighter because of the health risks you're exposed to, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. That when you first started out in your career, just like this person did, I'm sure they, they were not super going, oh, 20 years from now, I'm really excited for that to be my future. We have to be intentional about this. We have to be intentional about prioritizing our health, prioritizing our wellness, our comprehensive wellness, because due to the circumstances of being a firefighter, the risks that are associated with this job, in addition to other things, if you do nothing, you likely will not end up in a positive outcome that you are really excited about. So we have to start thinking, changing our minds a little bit about why we're doing what we're doing. And while it might be something that you say, yeah, I just wanna feel good when I take my shirt off at the beach, or I wanna feel strong when I go to you know, deadlift a 400 pound patient, whatever that looks like, those are viable, viable goals um, and real motivators. But we also have to get a little bit deeper. And when I think about my husband who is spent the better part of 20 years in the fire service. I want him to enjoy his long, happy, healthy retirement that he's earned, that he's worked really hard for. I want him to be able to walk our girls down the aisle when or if they get married. And I want him to be pain-free when he does that or to be able to throw a ball with our grandkids if we end up having them. So we have to go a little bit deeper to why we're doing what we're doing in order for change to actually happen. So the first thing we have to do is change our mindset. And we want to get something to a little, we want to get to something that's a little bit deeper, which is what is often referred to as true health. And true health is only for you to define. You decide what that looks like. But some ways to get there is to think about the happiest, healthiest, most well-fed version of me. What am I doing? What am I feeling? What am I experiencing? What am I able to do? What does my life look like? And only you can define that. When you think about that future state of who you want to be when you retire or in the next five years or even in the next year, what does that look like? And start peeling back the layers of why that's important to you. Because yes, you can say, man, I just wanna have six packs, a six pack for summer, great. Why is that important? What does that represent for you? So getting to those deeper levels is really powerful because when we look at where we fall on this illness wellness continuum, many of us would put ourselves right in that middle green space of neutral. And in this space, we don't really have any symptoms. You know, it's like, yeah, maybe my knee hurts a little bit here and there, or, you know, I might have a flare up of something, but nothing major that I have to manage. And I'm kind of inconsistent with my nutrition or my exercise. And I kind of have some sporadic habits. You know, maybe I'll go gung-ho or I'll try this challenge or we're going to do the, you know, we're going to prep for Murph. Um, but then things kind of fall away. Really underneath all of that, health is not a priority because it doesn't need to be. Your body's not screaming at you. But it should be. Because when we find ourselves in this neutral spot, as we talked about, if we do nothing, the environment around us, because of a lot of those factors that are stacked against you, you will inevitably slowly creep down that scale toward disease, like the case study that I shared. So bringing intention to this 
being intentional about regular exercise, about implementing quality nutrition, uh, about being having mindful practices. We want to get to good health and potentially optimum. I mean, how awesome would it be if everything is functioning at 100%? We're continuously finding ways to challenge and develop ourselves. We're very active in, and participating in our life. We're not limited in any capacity because wellness as a comprehensive, a comprehensive approach is a lifestyle for us. Wouldn't that be great? But we don't just happen to get there. We don't just luck into it. We have to be intentional. And the way we can be intentional about that is by first changing our mindset. So the first mindset shift I'm gonna ask you to make is to start thinking of yourself as a tactical athlete. Whether you view yourself this way or not, it is time to put intention to this and think of yourself as a tactical athlete. Now you might be a tactical athlete as a probationary firefighter, or you might be a tactical athlete as a battalion chief and the, the work demands in those different positions look different. But at the end of the day, you are able to meet the demands of your job because you do have to use your body to execute your job. So you eat, you train, you learn, you're becoming proficient in all of, the, all of these different aspects in order to actually meet the demands of your job. So if you're just shooting from the hip when it comes to nutrition, you're like, I don't know, what does it feel? What do I feel like eating right now? Well, you're not really being intentional about it because athletes don't do that. They think about how they can fuel themselves well, what they need to eat in order to support recovery, what they need to choose in order to keep their energy levels high. So how I approach nutrition, how this program is designed is from a functional perspective. Now, when we think about functional nutrition, it's easy to connect with functional fitness because this is probably something you're familiar with. There are certain movement patterns that you have to be proficient at that are foundational in order for you to be good at your job. You have to have good shoulder mobility, be able to press overhead to throw a ladder or to, you know, pull a roof uh, or pull ceiling. You do have to have a good hinge pattern and be able to deadlift well to do a lift assist. You have to be able to squat and have a good squat pattern. But what that looks like for you is probably a little bit different than the person next to you because you might have some old injuries that you're working through, some limited mobility, different hip wing, length, et cetera, but it's appropriate for you. So I want to help you understand fundamentals of nutrition in order to make choices and habits that support your body, your life, and your goals. So it really is simplified in these three categories that we built this nutrition campaign around. The first being helping you understand how to eat for health. Number one, you have to eat to support your health because there are certain health risks associated with the fire service that you can't avoid and you need to actively work to protect yourself against them. The second is learning how to eat for life because you have different demands on you. The demands when you're on duty are different than the demands at home and working to actively support the goals in your life are equally important. And the third piece of this which is my favorite, is helping you understand how to eat for real. When you know how food works or you begin to understand how food works and you're able to practice freedom, you get to mindfully indulge in those things that you love because nobody wants to live a life of restriction. If I told you, or let's say I told myself, I never get to enjoy a glass of bourbon again. I'm like, uh, no, thanks. I don't choose that. <laughs> I would like to figure out a way to integrate this. So we want to find a blend, find a happy medium, but we prioritize health first. Then we think about our goals and then we integrate some of those things that we love that actually still help us protect our health and support our goals. So it kind of come down, comes down to two basic principles. Number one, what do you need in order to keep your body healthy and energized? Now you can keep your body healthy, but you might be doing things that are not supporting your energy. So you wanna make sure that you're energized, particularly when you're on duty, because as you know, who knows what might come through as a call. So you have to make sure that you have plenty of energy on board to actually respond to that call. So when you're on duty, you definitely need to be energized, but also don't you wanna be energized when you're off duty? So you can do all the fun things that you wanna do. Maybe you go for a hike, maybe you're a hunter. Maybe you just want to coach your kids t-ball team, whatever that looks like. 
And then the second piece of this is what do I want? What do I want that's delicious and that tastes good? Because I don't know a single firefighter that's like, man, I just love to eat boring, bland food. No, like that's not a part of the fire service culture of anything. Like that is the opposite. Firefighters are known for making amazing food. So why not find a way that you can incorporate both? And that's what I say. I say there's room for both ends here. Now, when we talk about eating for health, the number one thing we have to acknowledge are simply the health risks associated with the fire service. First and foremost, the exposure to toxins. We know that you are at elevated risk, particularly for cancer because of the toxins that you're exposed to. Number two, there tends to be a sedentary lifestyle associated with the fire service. What I mean by that is there's a lot of go when calls come through, but there's also some stops. So it's, we're trying to find that balance where you're still staying active outside of duty and also when there's not a high call volume. Of course, there's high stress. Cortisol, like it floods your bloodstream often because of the work that you do and that go and stop um, lifestyle, especially when you're on duty. Interrupted sleep, we know that there's some health risks associated with that. And then, you know, cultural norms. When you get together with other firefighters, what are you often doing? Eating pizza, drinking beer, drinking, you know, whiskey, whatever is your thing. So you want to make sure that you're finding this blend of where you're protecting your health and still enjoying the culture of the fire service. Now, why does this matter? Well, when we look at food specifically, we look at the typical diet of you know, people in North America, the US and Canada. What we know from research is for most people, now this isn't just firefighters, just like average population, most people consume over 60% of their calories are coming from highly processed, low quality foods. And why this matters for your health is because we're not getting the nutrients, the high quality nutrient dense foods that we need to be health protective. So that's the first piece is we know kind of inevitably most people are not eating in a style that supports their health. Well, what am I supposed to eat? What does support my health? This is where I like to look at real science and then apply it to real life. So when we look at the science of the most widely researched diets out there, you can see all five listed here. There's a lot of research that supports all of these different styles of eating for health. And you'll notice not one is highlighted over the others. So let me go through this a little bit. We've got fully plant-based. And then as we go around the clock, we've got paleo, then keto, Mediterranean, and low fat. And all of them have research backed claims as to why they are health protective. But when you look at them, it's easy to say uh, they seem to be the opposite. I mean, low fat and keto feel very opposite. Paleo and Mediterranean also feel very opposite. But I think the better question is, what is the same? So when we pull back the layers and we look at what's underneath these different dietary approaches, we have some fundamentals that are captured here on the screen. Number one, they all emphasize eating more whole real food. Why? Because that's where we get a lot of our nutrients. It's high quality, um, low, um, sorry, it's high, uh, high quality food uh, that carries a lot of nutrients with it. Number two, they also include enough quality protein. Now what this looks like for being fully plant-based versus paleo or keto, the volume is going to be different, but they all emphasize the importance of protein. The next piece of this is they're incorporating vegetables. Why? Because that's where our vitamins and minerals are coming from. We're prioritizing nutrient density from those plants, from those vegetables to fill us up. As a result, we're minimizing those highly processed, low quality foods. And then the, third, the last piece of this is a behavioral component, which doesn't get talked about a whole lot. And that's eating slow until you're satisfied. And I totally get in the context of the firehouse, depending on your call volume, that might not be realistic, but you're not always at the firehouse. So recognizing to tune into your body, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, and eating slow, stopping when you're satisfied can also be a great habit. So let's dive into all of these fundamentals and how they can now be applied to real life. So we've established we need to eat more whole real food. 
A simple reminder for this is it came from a plant or it came from an animal. Pretty simple. Now, of those things that came from a plant or an animal, the next thing we absolutely have to prioritize is protein. The reason protein is essential, and I say essential because you need this to survive, is because inside protein are little building block components. I think of like Legos. So they're the little Legos that build your cell structures called amino acids, essential amino acids. We get these from protein. Mostly, for most of us, we get them from animal-based protein. And we have to eat, these, uh, eat adequate amounts of protein uh, not just to support ourselves, but also to thrive as a tactical athlete. So instead of you know saying, oh, I want you to eat 25 grams of protein, most people don't know what that looks like, but we walk around with our hands all the time. So these are a great portion sizing guide that you can use to start integrating. Am I getting enough protein? And you can see on the screen there, I usually recommend one to two palm sized servings of protein in every single meal. Now, if you do the basic math, most of us are eating about four times a day. So that's anywhere from four to eight palm-sized servings of protein throughout the day. And this can look like wild game, bison, beef, pork, poultry, seafood, fish, even beans and legumes. And you have to remember our bodies love variety and the density of the protein from, let's say a cut of steak, let's say a sirloin steak versus you know, a piece of fish is going to vary uh, greatly. So we want to make sure that we're being, um, we're including variety in our protein sources. Now, as I go through this, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop them in the chat. Grant, I see your question. Will, your, will the slides be available after? No, they will not, but I will um, have a recording of this uh, that we will share with everyone that has registered. So we also, Grant, to your question, we have tons of resources that talk about this on the IAFF website, and I'll even put it in the chat here. It's iaff.org slash nutrition is the website you will go to. You can check that out um, at the end of our webinar. I've got a slide for that as well. So after protein, the next thing that is essential, well, you guessed it, vegetables. I know it's not everyone's favorite. And I will say, I get a lot of resistant, resistance from firefighters like, well, you have to eat vegetables. Actually, it's not usually from you. It's from the crew that you work with or some of your colleagues, your coworkers. Like, really? I have to put vegetables in this? Yes. I'm just asking you to add color to your plate and choose ways that you actually enjoy. We're aiming for one to two fistfuls of vegetables in every single meal. And if you're not enjoying the way you're making vegetables, try something different because there are lots of ways to make vegetables that actually taste good. One of the best ways to eat vegetables that taste good is to include fat. Vegetables can be your fat delivery system. Sometimes what happens though is we aren't intentional about the fats we're choosing, let alone the quantity of that. So we're trying to get one to two thumb size servings in every meal. And going back to our first principle of choosing food that came from a plant, or an animal, we want to make sure that we're choosing better quality fats as opposed to really highly processed, lots of trans fat, etc. So we, I've got some ideas here, you know, oils, egg yolks, nuts and seeds. I love avocado oil, extra virgin olive oil, even grapeseed oil or coconut oil, lots of fish, dairy, etc. So most of the fat that we consume should come from plant sources with a little bit of animal sources as well. Grant, I see your question, how do protein shakes relate to protein intake? Uh, we can talk at the end about protein shakes specifically, but I consider protein powder a food source. So think of Little Miss Muffet. She sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. Most protein supplements are whey-based protein, which comes from a cow. So that's what I consider it, but they're also plant-based uh, protein powders or egg whites, even cricket protein. So yeah, I consider it a food source, but we'll talk about what makes up those protein shakes at the end. Now, the last piece of this is carbohydrates. So we need um, protein. It's essential. We need the vitamins and minerals that come from vegetables. We need the essential fatty acids from good quality fats. Unfortunately, we don't need carbs to survive, but we definitely need carbs to thrive, particularly as a tactical athlete. 
So what I try to remind everyone is that carbohydrates are your body's primary energy source. So if you notice that your energy is really in the toilet, maybe you need to eat a little bit more, maybe you need to add some more protein, or maybe you're just not eating enough carbohydrates. The unfortunate thing about carbohydrates is there's such a spectrum that we usually go to the easy, highly dense carbohydrate sources. And I'm gonna challenge you to be a little bit smarter about that. So go back to that idea of carbs that came from the ground. So root vegetables, beans and legumes, fruit, those are great carbs, potatoes, rice, pastas even. And then we can work into things that are a lot more dense like breads and sugary treats. But carbohydrates are essential as a tactical athlete to keep your energy levels up. And how you can put this together is a very simple framework that I came up with. I use the acronym EPIC. And when you think about EPIC, like if you're gonna eat an EPIC meal, what does that look like? What does that feel like? Well, to me, an EPIC meal is one that I'm excited about, that I'm looking forward to, that I know is gonna taste good. And it includes the essential components we just talked about. So EPIC is an acronym, and you can take a screenshot of this or you can take some notes. E-P-I-C is really simple. E, I'm gonna eat whole real food. P, I'm gonna prioritize protein. That's gonna be the star on my plate, the star in my meal. I, I'm gonna include vegetables any, any chance I get. And then obviously with those vegetables, we're gonna include intentional fat. And then the C, I'm gonna choose smart carbs. And that is how I build epic meals. That's how you can build epic meals. What's awesome about this, this simple approach, trying to eat more epic meals, is that you can roll into any context, any situation and find a way to make it epic. Let's say you're on duty. You just had four calls in the last two hours. You're gonna stop at the gas station. Uh, you're gonna fuel up the rig and it's like, hurry, grab some food. Well, if I'm at the gas station, I need to get an epic meal in. It might be a smaller meal, but I need some food. So if I think about this whole real food, well, maybe I can find some jerky because that's protein, maybe even some hard boiled eggs. I don't know if I can find vegetables, maybe they have a little vegetable cup. And then I, maybe they have an apple or a banana, some fruit, but I can also get creative in there with what I have available. So if I approach it with this epic framework, I can do it at a gas station, I can do it at a fast food restaurant, I could find an epic meal at McDonald's, I can do it when I'm on a date, and I for sure can do it when I'm grocery shopping and planning out my meals for myself and my family. Just ask yourself, how can I make this epic? So if I'm headed to Chipotle, well, I'm gonna eat mostly whole real food. Thank goodness, that's mostly what they have there. Prioritize protein, what protein do I want? Include vegetables, oh, I've got you know fajita vegetables. Maybe I can throw some lettuce in my burrito. I'm gonna choose smart carbs, You know, maybe some beans, I'll get some extra protein and some rice. So we can be epic in any context. When we think about this, the blend between at home and on duty, typically what I hear from firefighters is one of two challenges. Either they're really good at eating at home because they have more control, they're able to plan ahead, but they struggle on duty because there's some competing preferences and you know maybe their crew isn't on board. Or the, the opposite is true. They're really good about eating on duty because everybody's in alignment and the crew really wants to prioritize eating quality food. And then when they go home, they just go ham, <laughs> eat all the things because they were so good on shift. And now they're at home. It's like, oh, I've got all the treats for my kids, all the goldfish, Oreos, all the things. So regardless of where you find yourself in the context of either of those situations, when you're at home, remember, you can plan ahead. And in fact, that's how you set yourself up for success. And you are in more control because you decide what you're putting in the environment around you. You decide what gets stocked in your fridge and your pantry and your freezer. And you can have a conversation with your family, with your partner, with your roommate, whatever situation you're in and say, hey, I'm really trying to change my eating habits to be more supportive of my goals. Can you help me? You can also have that same conversation with your crew. So when you go on duty and you're trying to make some uh, changes, uh, have that conversation, but also remember that if you're pointing your finger at your crew and saying, oh, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this, 
remember that you've got three other fingers that are pointing back at you. So it's not about what every, everyone else should do. A great tip that I have, if you're going on duty and you feel like your crew isn't super supportive of you making some changes to your eating habits, ask yourself, what can I add to this situation that'll get me a little bit closer to my goals? So if it's Friday pizza night and that's what your crew has done, let's say they've done it for the last 10 years and who are you to interrupt Friday pizza night? Well, just ask yourself, how can I include some more vegetables with this? Maybe I can get a salad to go along with it. Yeah, you might get some flack for it, but that's okay. It's probably worth it. But you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? How am I going to add some protein to this, et cetera? So thinking through how you can add to the situation, not subtract. Because you'll definitely get a lot of pushback if your crew starts making something. You're like, well, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. I can't eat that. Ask yourself, what can I add here that will actually help me add, not subtract? And again, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. When we talk about mindful indulgence, because yes, there is a time and a place for you to enjoy ice cream. I think Monday was National Ice Cream Day. We do have to be real about this because when we deprive ourselves of things that we love, what we're doing is reinforcing binge eating behaviors and we start to develop a disorder, disordered perspective of food. And we don't want that. That's not good for our long-term mental or physical health. So this practice of mindful indulgence, mindful eating is really a great tool that you can have in your tool belt, again, in any context that you find yourself. So let's say you're meeting up with some friends and you're you know, at a local bar and you get some nachos and you order your favorite beer, whatever that is. That doesn't have to be reason for you to label that you've fallen off you know, your eating wagon, whatever that is. In those situations where you're like, yeah, I'm just gonna enjoy this. I'm just gonna indulge in this thing and it's going to be okay. The first thing that you can practice is slowing down. Let it be an experience. Slow down and actually enjoy it. In the process of slowing down, what inevitably happens is you start paying attention to the feedback that your body sends you. And you happen to notice when you actually get full. So you're gonna pay attention to the way that the food tastes. Maybe by you know, your fourth slice of pizza, it's not quite as good as that first one. So maybe you don't finish the whole thing and that's okay. And you also pay attention to how your body feels before, during, after eating. Okay, I'm picking up that I'm really stressed right now or I'm exhausted. So I wanna eat all the you know, sugar, cinnamon and sugar tortillas that I can get my hands on. Uh, whatever that is, you can start to notice those situations that you find yourselves maybe choosing behavior that's not supportive. But also if you ate something that's like, hmm, I don't know if that's really worth it because it started to make me feel kind of sick to my stomach. It wasn't worth it after the fact. When you slow down and you pay attention, you also can catch yourself in the moment when you are satisfied, feeling satisfied. How many of us find ourselves when we're eating something, it's like, oh, I have to eat all of it now because I don't know when I'll get it again. And then we overconsume, and we're so stuffed that we're actually uncomfortable. How great would it be to walk away from that situation? Like, no, I feel good. I feel satisfied. So this practice of mindful indulgence is really powerful, but it's not just about indulgent food. It's also just about what you put on your plate. And I know how it is at the firehouse. You know, you serve it up and you actually overserve yourself because everyone else is going to eat all of it, right? I, I better get my portion now. But if you slow down, pay attention, and stop when you're satisfied, is, would it be horrible if you didn't eat everything on your plate and you had a little left over as long as you were satisfied? Probably not. So just this habit of mindful indulgence, I think, is really powerful. The other piece of this to keep in mind for those of you that maybe have kids, and I'm just going to speak from personal experience as the wife of a firefighter. I have count, caught my family multiple times, played up at our face, at our mouth, just shoveling things in. And this is a habit that my kids learned by observing their dad because he ate so fast because of his experience in the firehouse. I don't know when the next call is gonna come through, so I better eat fast. Unfortunately, that behavior has carried over to home 
and there's no calls coming through when he's at home. And that, then my kids have happened to pick up that behavior. So some strategies to help you just catch you in the moment when you don't need to be rushed. First is just to take a breath, breathe in between your bites, maybe drink some water, put your fork down. So these are all habits that you have to be mindful of in the moment in order for it to be effective. It's one thing to talk about it. It is a whole other thing to actually do it and put it into practice. And with all of this stuff, I also want you to remember that it is practice, not perfection. So you're going to be good at some things and you're gonna struggle with some other things, but give yourself grace to practice and to make space for progress to happen. The way that we make space for progress to happen is one, to avoid extremes. If you find yourself in a situation where you're, you've adopted a certain diet or a certain um, style of eating, that's really challenging for you. It feels really inconsistent with what you do, quote unquote, in real life or in normal life. It probably is not say, setting you up for success. So you wanna think about, am I doing, and what I do, excuse me, what I'm doing, can I continue for the next five days, the next five weeks, the next five months or five years? Because how awesome would it be five years from now for you to be in a position where you say, gosh, I feel really happy, really healthy and really well-fed in my body. This is awesome. I haven't had to go on and off the diet roller coaster. I just found a way of eating that's actually sustainable. We also have to ditch this all or nothing mentality because something is better than nothing. Even if it's Friday night and your crew's like, hey, we're gonna hit the local drive-through. You know, it's greasy burgers, tater tots, milkshakes, all the things. Okay, let that be the experience. And then ask yourself after that, okay, what am I gonna do next that is going to be something that is good for me? Maybe in the morning, I'm gonna have some, you know, Greek yogurt and some frozen berries uh, and make myself, you know, a smoothie, something like that. We want to ditch this all or nothing mentality because what that leads to is very sporadic efforts. So you'll go hard for 10 days or you'll go hard for 30 days or the latest thing, you'll go hard for 75 days and then you're off. But how do you carry that through for a consistent lifestyle? One key way is to focus on the small wins. What is one small action that I can take right now to get me moving in the direction that I need to go. And for some people that one small action is, I'm gonna drink a big old glass of water before I reach for my afternoon monster. I'll tell you the story, just that simple water approach. I was working with a client, he was coming up on retirement and he reached out to me and he's like, Lisa, I'm a big elk hunter and my health has just gone in the toilet the last few years. There's no way that when I go elk hunting next season, if I shoot an elk, there's no way I'm going to be able to hike that thing out. Uh, like my knees ache. I've got too much excess body weight. I'm super deconditioned. I need some help. I know I need to train for this, but I also need some help with nutrition. And when I talked with him, we did a little, um, you know, food log just to see like, where are you at right now? What are you normally consuming? And he was drinking six Dr. Pepper bottles, like the, you know, like the little ones a day, six of them a day instead of water. So the one small win that we worked on was that he had to drink the equivalent of water before he could reach for his next Dr. Pepper, because that had been such a habit for him that that was his hydration source. So just that small tweak, you can imagine he's just filling up with fluid. In the course of three days, we had cut his uh, Dr. Pepper consumption from six bottles down to three. And then after a week, we were down to one, one Dr. Pepper a day. And it took us about 30 days for him to say, you know what, I think I just need to take a break from drinking Dr. Pepper uh, and just drink water. And this wasn't me bossing him. This was him practicing these small wins, feeling what success looks like and what it feels like, and then deciding where do I go from here? Because I don't know about you, I have countless experiences of where I have tried and subsequently failed at so many different diets. 
And we need to get in the habit of experiencing wins when it comes to dietary interventions. We wanna know what it feels like to make some change, to make some positive change. So practicing those small wins can be very, very powerful. And that's usually where I start working with most of my clients is just those small wins because we don't need to tackle everything. We're not trying to do a major life overhaul. Will we get there? Yes. But we go from zero to one and then one to two. So by the time we get up to 95, 96, 97, 98, it's just one little step to 99 and then one little step to 100. And then, wow, look at all that progress that we've made. So it doesn't need to be a major overhaul. And if it is, it's likely going to be sporadic and inconsistent. Now I talk about food because it is just one piece of the bigger puzzle. And as I mentioned, I have a heart for 90s hip hop and Tupac in one of his songs, he says, let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. Let's change the way we treat each other. And you might be laughing because I know uh, he did not intend for a suburban white woman to be using his uh, lyrics as a reference for nutrition, particularly in this context. So I like that because to me, it speaks to the power of food. So stick with me, going back to that case study that I had mentioned, you know, when we eat a certain way that isn't supportive of our body or goals um, or our health, it starts to make us feel a certain way in our body. Maybe we have an upset stomach, Maybe we feel really lethargic and tired and we end up kind of being grumpy. So then we're grumpy with ourselves and we're also grumpy with the people around us. And because we feel grumpy about that stuff, it makes us want to eat, reinforce, maybe I'm going to keep eating in this way because maybe it'll make me feel better. So we kind of get on this downward spiral that can be a little tricky to get off of. And I would never say that just changing, you know, the way you eat will overhaul your whole life but it might be the lead domino that begins to knock over other things. So if you change the way you eat and now you're eating in a way that supports your goals, supports your body, supports your health, and you notice, oh, I don't feel as uncomfortable in my physical body anymore. I actually feel energized um, and I'm proud of myself. So I start treating myself differently. And then I start treating the people around me a little differently. What that can do as an upward spiral. So food can just be one of the dominoes that you begin to tackle to start to make some change. But food is inside your physical wellness, just like movement, just like sleep, just like stress management. So when we think about this, maybe food isn't your lead domino, maybe not yet but it will always be here as something that you can begin to tackle once you figure out your lead domino. There are lots of other ways for you to approach this. So when we think about comprehensive wellness, you are whole people, you are a whole person. And while food is impactful, it's not therapy, it's not medical interventions, uh, and it doesn't do anything for your movement practices. So uh, I encourage you, to figure out what your lead domino is. And you're here because you thought, oh, maybe food is the thing that I need. I'm ready to tackle this. I wanna make myself available for you as a resource. So some next steps that I'll ask you to do, particularly in partnership with the IAFF. Number one, we have a nutrition Facebook group. And I know social media is not everybody's favorite, but inside the IAFF nutrition group, this is where we host nutrition challenges. If you're ready and you wanna try a real food challenge, we will be hosting that in August. Uh, so that is to come. Uh, you can uh, just request to join and we'll approve your, um, your request, uh, no problem. And then in August, we are hosting 30 days of real food. Now, if you're like, hey, I'm super gung-ho, I wanna actually host a challenge with my crew, with my department, with my local, we've got nutrition challenge guides that you can download and you can host yourself. That in combination with a large amount of resources are available on the IAFF nutrition website, which is listed there. So there on the website, you will find a firefighter nutrition guide. This is a comprehensive guide that goes over everything that I talked about today and more. We talk about hydration. Uh, we talk about supplementation. We talk about sleep recovery, those kinds of things. 
because those are all equally important. So at the base level, your stress management, your sleep practices are really important. Then we move up and we talk about nutrition. Then we move up and we talk about fitness and training. So if you're not sleeping well, if you're not recovering well, then you're likely not going to fuel well, to eat well. And if you're not eating well, you're likely not going to train well. So that's kind of how that pyramid works. Sean. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for your time. Um, I wish you well. If you were on duty, I hope you are staying safe. And if you're off duty, I hope you're making time for some rest, for some recovery and some good food. So with that, I'm going to sign off. So thank you all. Have a fantastic day and hopefully take, uh, I will connect with you soon online. All right. Take care, everyone.